In society, we are surrounded by um, daily chaos, chaos which for many people um, can just blend into the background, them not being even aware of it, it's, it's there, like sounds, smells, sights. Um, for me, these were, and still can be to a point, exaggerated, and I can find myself um, in, in a height of anxiety, um, giving me that kind of low-level rumbling headache before I'd even got to whether it was school or work. Um, sounds for me, um, again, were and still are exaggerated, and um, I can't hear myself think um, in, amongst the chaos whether that chaos is a busy road, um, a group of people. Um, so imagine walking past that group of people um, and not being able to decipher what their joke may be, what they're talking about. Um, the natural thing for anyone is to, um, to walk past, you look up, you look them in the eye. And at one point in my life, that would have been really painful. I use the word pain because it was painful. You get almost that electricity shock running through um, your, um, y your body. Um, and it would take my brain so long to um, process this that by the end of the day, I was still fixated um, on this interaction. For me, um, going back years, we're talking sort of 80s, 90s, um, I only had the bus as my mode of transport. Um, it was the old, you either had the old school bus or you had um, the old village bus. And the smell of those old buses, you get on the bus, you'd have the waft of the cigarette smoke, because people are still able to smoke on the buses, wafting down. Immediately you feel that nauseousness, you would get that rumbling headache, and then you'd sit down, and you'd sit by a stranger, somebody you didn't know, and that so awkward, close feeling. They turn, you can smell their breath, and you can smell their clothes. And you, for me, um, that would almost reduce me immediately to tears. I knew I couldn't. Um, and I would immediately think of being at home. But I knew for that day, I had to continue wading through this chaos. Work, we all have to work, we all have to pay bills, we all have to um, buy food. Um, as a child, you, get, you can get away with um, having a meltdown, refusing to do things, not talking, but there is a certain adult expectation um, to work, to pay the bills, to live, otherwise you will end up in that shadow of society. There were work, work options for me um, at a very young age, young for me, um, and I had the choice of um, either staying at home or working, and the working to get the things that my peers were telling me that I needed. Um, so I went to work, um, but every shift would reduce me to tears. Um, I'd have the smell of the restaurant where I worked, the shop where I worked. I had the people there. I couldn't quite decipher what they were talking about. And at that point, because um, of low self-esteem, I'd just assume it was about me. I'd have the firing of instructions, um, instructions that I couldn't understand, couldn't keep in my head. Um, and they'd be talking about things that were alien to me. So they'd be talking about their social life. Um, they'd ask me about my social life. And at this point, at a young age, it was absolutely non-existence. Um, things would throw me, so I would be doing my job, and all of a sudden, there'd be a smell. I think that would take me right back to a bad past. There would be a person walking in. It could be a bully from the past. But rather than it just take me back and me get over it, it would take me back to that moment, so I was feeling every single step of that time when that was happening to me. What I needed when I was working, I needed space to process things, I needed quietness. 
I didn't have that, obviously. So it would go in the to-do pile, and um, my brain would start to overload. But there was no time for me to process this. Luckily for me, um, I had a secret with my dad that if I wasn't coping, just give him the nod, fine. I didn't need to work. For others, um, there were the assumptions that... Um, I'd be nobody, I wouldn't have any friends, I wouldn't have a job, I'd have no life. And it just put me in that shadow of society. When I did start working, so moving on a bit, sort of early, late teens, um, I, um, I didn't quite fit in. Um, I didn't quite understand what was going on. I tried. I tried to take things on. I tried, to, I tried the jokes, got the jokes wrong. I spoke too loud. I, I, I said the wrong thing. Um, I would try humour, and that would fail. So instead, I just decided that I'd just sit back and watch as much as I could. To work out these interactions, human interactions, was completely baffling me. Um, and if I did work it out, um, I struggled because I'd be talking to the person and I would fixate on, rather than what they were talking about, I'd fixate on, it could be the light above them, the smell of their clothes. The, and because there was a lot of noise around, um, I, I struggled to follow the conversation. Um, so I'd often be accused of being deaf, be told to check my hearing. There's nothing wrong with my hearing. It was just the processing of all this information. Our reputation is, you know, it can be at stake. We do the things that we need to do. And I read an article um, recently. Um, it was an article from 1959, um, which said that um, from past experiences, we could tell which kind of people would be in which social settings. Although we've come far now, um, a, a lot further, we still are expected to do things like work, like pay bills, education. People look at how much you earn, what education you've got. Um, and you have to appear normal and appear to be part of that. For me, it all took its toll on me. And I um, began to do things like I'd self-harm. Um, I thought myself as the devil's child. Um, I would um, struggle hugely. Um, and I didn't understand why. Everyone just got on with it, and I just faltered at every single step. That was really difficult for me, and there was no explanation. I realized that it was about faking it to make it. So I started on this journey of starting to look at what other people were doing. Luckily, I had my dad, so I could check things out with him. But imagine, two months later, he died. Um, and every, there was no one else who could understand me. I tried, but it didn't work. Luckily, I did have a GP who, although he didn't understand, was with me on that journey. I'll give you an example of uh, me trying to work things out. And um, we had a photocopier. So the photocopier was in another room. Um, when I went to photocopy, well, when other people went to photocopy, people would look at them, say hello, nod at them. When I went in, everyone ignored me. I thought it was very odd. So I kept watching them and watching them. And then I noticed that people would raise their head, say hello. So I started doing this, and it started to work, and I started to move on. Um, unscheduled interactions, that, you know, they were and still are quite difficult for me, and I can struggle with those. Um, but just imagine at every step, what you have going through your head, I was having 10 times, 100 times that information to process at the time. It took one person to recognize what I was going through, luckily. Luckily, they were the one that employed me. Um, so um, I still got comments. I got comments from people. I got comments from people telling me what others thought. I got comments, um, you know, quite nasty comments. But I was committed to this work ethic. And my dad, the one thing he did give me, he gave me hope. Um, and he gave me uh, this work ethic. So I had to carry on. 
then I decided at one point, I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to cure myself. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to find a cure, get over this. And it was at this point, on my own, I realized I'd had, I had Asperger's. It was difficult to, um, to diagnose because I'd camouflaged it my whole life. I had to camouflage it. I, um, so people were recognizing it, but they were even the, the uh, professionals still weren't. You know, they would if you go into work, that's fine. Get on with it, you're fine. But it took a long time for me to, um, you know, to, to, to get people to understand. Um, it then took a second person to come into my life, a mentor, who began to empower me in the workplace, empower me outside the workplace. And um, they, I began to, um, I got support from the local mental health um, team as well, and I began to move on. I began to accept this. That was at 23, the age of 23, that I got the diagnosis. This was now approaching 40s that I began to actually feel like a real person. I began to open up to people. Sometimes that went wrong. Sometimes I got extremely bullied by it. But I began to open up. I began to find things that um, I could work with. So, you know, I'd have a, a, a few friends that we do, you know, they accepted the social things I do and I don't do. They had um, the support of when I go out with my dog. Um, you know, she's my social tool for people when I'm talking to people. And it was at this point, following that hope that my dad had given me, I thought, right, I need to tell people about this. What, what if I don't tell my story? What about those that are coming through the same journey as me? What about those who don't see that light? I need to be out there telling my story and telling educating people about this. I need to support those that are still coming through the system and letting them know that actually you do get on this journey, you do cope. That is why I'm here today um, at, TED, at TED. And now at 43, I've actually learned to tell my story and to hopefully empower, empower people. Thank you.